Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and Marvel Studios finally unveiled their path forward in Phase 5 and Phase 6, and it is through Kang, with Jonathan Majors putting the nasty in Kang Dynasty, as we now embark on this road to Secret Wars. Attendees at San Diego Comic-Con were shown exclusive footage for Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, revealing the true Kang the Conqueror after his variant's debut in Loki. I paved the road. You? You just walked down it. Yes, walked past tense. The road we have all been on this whole time in the MCU was steamrolled by this self-described jerk. And now we're gonna find out what exactly he meant by that and what his plan is through Fantastic Four, Kang Dynasty, and Secret Wars. So I'm gonna break down what this Quantumania footage was and how this film will point to our new destination at the end of all time, the back-to-back -back Avengers films of 2025, Kang Dynasty, and Secret Wars. Who will be fighting in those battles? So Kevin Feige confirmed that Marvel Phase 5 is beginning with Ant-Man the Wasp Quantumania, coming February 2023, Quantumania really being the midpoint of the current multiverse saga that will lead into Phase 6 with the Fantastic Four in November 8th, 2024, followed by Avengers The Kang Dynasty on May 5th, 2025, and Avengers Secret Wars on November 7th, 2025. Phase 4 has really been some Infinity Saga reactive coasting with hints at this journey with He Remains and Loki. Just wait till you meet my very lines from Jim Halpert in Multiverse of Madness. The larger the footprint you leave behind, the greater the risk of an incursion. Incursion? An incursion occurs when the boundary between two universes erodes and they collide, destroying one or both entirely. But now, Quantum Mania will firmly lock us in on a clear trajectory towards this next endgame. So let's break down exactly what happened in the Quantum Mania footage at Comic Con. It starts with Scott Lang saying, Do I miss the action? Sometimes. Will I be there when the Avengers need me? Absolutely. But right now, the only job I want is being a dad. I love you, Cassie. Thanks for being my hero. And for the rest of you kids out there, a word of advice look out for the little guy. And we learn that Scott is at a book reading for his new memoir, Look Out for the Little Guy. We also know from Ms. Marvel that Scott had a podcast called Big Me, Little Me on this powered life, which is how apparently the world learned about the events of Infinity War and Endgame. But then Scott's phone rings and he asks, why is jail calling? And then he bails out his daughter, Cassie Lang, now recast as Catherine Newton. And he tells her, look, I get it. I do, Cassie. I really do. You want to help, but I know how much you're wasting your life. But then Cassie shoots back, at least we're trying to do something that matters. Yes, we, suggesting that Cassie might be now stature, leaving the young Avengers, and that's what landed her in jail. But Scott responds, I literally saved the world. And then Hank Pym mocks, oh, did you? You never mentioned that before. Everybody, Scott saved the world. Then Hope Van Dyne joins in the laugh. Oh, is that right, Scott? You should write a book about it. And Scott says, ha ha, hilarious. You're welcome for you all not being dust. But the next, we hear Jonathan Major's voiceover as Kang. He says, you're an interesting man, Scott Lang. You've lost a lot of time, but time isn't what you think. It's not a straight line. Referring to Scott Lang time dilating ahead five years in Endgame, missing out on Cassie's formative years. Then Cassie gets sucked into some bright blue light, and then the adults re-enter the quantum realm. Kang's voice goes on. When you can see time the way I do, you can see everything. And we see some residents of the quantum realm civilization, some of them cranking large disks mounted to a wall. We see Bill Murray's character who says, Janet Van Dyne, I thought you were dead. Suggesting he might have been some boyfriend of hers while she was down in the quantum realm. And then Kang's voiceover continues, your reality, everything you're holding on to, everything you call a life, I know how it ends. And some footage shows spinning disks and bands, machinery rotating around Kang that all eventually lock into place to form a platform that he strolls across. This montage also includes a brief shot of Modox, angry purple face, some rumors that Corey Stoll as Darren Cross from the 2015 film might have been deformed during his time in the quantum realm into what we now know as Modok from the comics, mechanized organism designed only for killing the giant headed hover chair seated hilarious jerk from AIM. I've done a few videos on the channel about this guy and how he might actually show up in Ant-Man the Wasp Quantumania. And this footage ends with Scott Lang saying, um, I don't know who you are, but you've made a big mistake. I'm an Avenger. And Kang finally shows his face saying, you're an Avenger, have I killed you before? And with that one calm, smug question, Kang lays out everything he's been up to. Kevin Feige confirmed that the multiverse saga is all Kang's doing, saying there's nobody's shoulders I'd rather be putting the multiverse saga on than his. It's really impressive that Jonathan Majors is able to do all the different incarnations, variants, if you will, of Kang that we will see him do. It's really pretty cool. So what did Kang mean by all of these things? Kang tells Scott that time is not a straight line, referring to the sacred timeline that we saw in Loki, which was depicted orbiting around the Citadel in a curved loop, meaning that 
that for Kang and for his variants, all of history unfolds all at once. Time is made up of a tightly coiled loop of countless histories playing over and over and over again. Kang has lived through them all. He knows how it all ends and how it all begins. And that includes, we now know, histories in which he has killed Avengers. This man has killed so many Avengers over so many different timelines that he cannot remember if Scott Lang was one of them. It's also kind of a diss at Scott Lang because, you know, even Broadway producers don't know whether or not Scott Lang was in a battle or not. Now, every single one of these sacred timeline coils has their own variant of Kang. These Kangs in the comics collectivize in an assembly known as the Council of Kangs, also the Kang Dynasty. They gather in these big arenas and just kind of shout over each other. In the Loki season one finale, he remains suggested that many of his past variants, when they were still the 31st century scientist Nathaniel Richards, went to war with each other until only he was left he who remains. But that wasn't necessarily a war against Kang's, it was really a war among Nathaniels's that led to He Who Remains. He Who Remains variants now are presumably the other winners of such wars who live on as part of this collective of Kang's. So when you kill one Kang variant, there's always another one somewhere out in the time stream to take his place. Thus an endless dynasty of rulers, a Kang dynasty. So why is Kang important to this story, Ant-Man the Wasp Quantumania? Well, notice how Kang tells Scott, you've lost a lot of time. Scott Lang time dilated while he was in the quantum realm, but Janet Van Dyne did not during her time there. She just aged normally over 30 years. Why was that the case? Well, that's because while Scott was in the quantum realm, he also stumbled into a time vortex, which is a separate structure within the quantum realm. Notice how Janet told Scott, And don't get sucked into a time vortex. We won't be able to save you. Which means during Janet's time in the quantum realm, she and Bill Murray were aware of these things called time vortexes, but knew to stay away from them. They just aged normally in the quantum realm and never went into a time vortex. Now, as we have learned more about realms, dimensions, universes, and timelines in the MCU, I think the quantum realm is an example of a buffered dimension between universes and between timelines that all universes and points in time share a border with. And a time vortex, I believe, is an artificial construction built by someone to create a waypoint in the border of the quantum realm to various points in time. The Avengers used these waypoints in Endgame to navigate to specific points in the past. Tony Stark helped them do so by discovering the code to quantum navigation using an inverted Mobius strip. Mobius, remember, also being the name he who remains gives one of his agents. So I think what Tony unlocked there was actually the first piece of a puzzle that the Kangs will inevitably design. In fact, the rotating mechanisms that Kang uses in this Quantumania footage may be his clockwork as the engineer of the vortexes that the Avengers hijacked to complete the time heist. So when he remains said, I paved the road, he was absolutely including everything the Avengers did, including the time heist. That's why he remains TVA had that bullshit loophole for what the Avengers did. You have the wrong person. Oh, really? And who should we have? I suspect the Avengers. We're not here to talk about the Avengers. Oh, no? No. What they did was supposed to happen. You escaping was not. Ah, he remains therefore wanted the Avengers to go back in time to gather the Infinity Stones and undo what Thanos did. But the question is, did he remains design his sacred timeline that way in spite of his other Kang variants? Or did he do it with their knowledge and with their consent? Are they all together? Is he remains a representative of the rest of the Kangs? Or is he a rogue to this dynasty? I think he was a rogue. I think he remains was hiding from the other Kangs because notice he was so scared of his other variants. If you think I'm, Evil. Well, just wait till you meet my variants. And then after Sylvie kills He Remains, another Kang variant comes in with a noticeably different management style. He Remains was probably not on the same page as that other Kang. Now, if you're full of chivalry and really want to address someone as Lord and Lady, established titles can make it official. Established titles is a project based on a historic Scottish custom where landowners are referred to as lairds or lords and ladies in English. They let people buy as little as one square foot of dedicated land so that they can call themselves a lord or a lady. And in return, established titles commits to planting a tree. It's just a really fun way to help preserve the beautiful woodlands and biodiversity of Scotland while supporting global afforestation efforts. Established titles work with global charity Trees for the Future and One Tree Planted to help them plant a tree for every order. Plus, for those with Scottish heritage out there, it's just a great way to connect to your family roots. Your certificate features a unique plot number with which you can see the exact location of your land on a private estate in Edelston, Scotland, and an official certificate with a crest. You can get a couple pack for you and your partner with adjoining plots of land 
and you can literally have this gift ready in five minutes. So it makes an amazing last minute gift and established titles is actually running a massive sale right now. Plus, if you use the code new rockstars, you get an additional 10% off. So go to establishedtitles.com slash new rockstars to get your gifts now and help support this channel. And that statue, I assume, represents the versions of Kangs that we're now meeting in Quantumania. Compared to the puck-like rascal we met in Loki, this is the more menacing, self-serious Kang the Conqueror, whom he remains alluded to. I've been dubbed many names by many people. A ruler, a conqueror, he who remains, a jerk. And I think this Kang the Conqueror in Quantumania has come to collect a toll for the Avengers hijacking his time vortexes that he built into the quantum realm. So what made he remains in a sacred timeline different in this multiverse? What has made 616 unique is that it is the one timeline where a Kang allowed this timeline's Avengers to slip away and break the rules of time travel. Every other universe, I think, the Avengers are eventually caught up to by that Kang and undone, murdered by Kangs like the one we meet in Quantumania. Now, one of the few other dimensions we know about in the MCU is 838. Those heroes won their Infinity War without ever needing to discover time travel via quantum navigation. 838 Reed Richards was aware of the multiverse and incursions, and yes, his portal is based on the visual of Doctor Doom's time platform, but that Illuminati's concept the multiverse is really grounded in sorcery and dreamwalking. There's no indication that they were time travelers. But in 616, he who remains kept these Avengers safe and to begin to unlock the secrets of time. Why did he do that? I think he did that as a failsafe against his rival Kangs if anything ever happened to him. And now that something has happened to him, Sylvie stabbed him, the dam has been burst. And the 616 Avengers are in that nightmare scenario where they have to face his variants, the full might of the Kang dynasty. But the good news is he who remains left them with the keys to fight back against the dynasty so that they don't have to die nasty. The 616 Avengers have access to quantum time travel technology. As far as I know, Hulk still has that device. So I assume Quantum Mania will end with Scott Lang thwarting this Kang, or they're at least able to escape the Kang that Loki has to deal with in season two, but Scott Lang will quickly learn how impossible Kang is to kill since he's really part of a dynasty. Infinite whack-a-moles who can infinitely respawn. So I think the general game plan in phase five will be similar to what the Infinity Saga did with Thanos and the Infinity Stones. A gradual rollout, title by title, to just show in little ways how Kang has influenced all parts of Marvel history through his various identities. Pharaoh Ramatut, Immortus, or any other alias he's been using. Actually, since we're already in the multiverse saga, we may have already been seeing this process unfold. In Moon Knight, we saw an image of Pharaoh Ramatut on the back of a jacket worn by a guy in Cairo, implying that Pharaoh Ramatut existed in Egyptian history in 616. We could see this in future titles like Blade. This movie could drop a line about how Sir Percival found the Ebony Blade in the tomb of an Egyptian pharaoh. Maybe Agatha Coven of Chaos could talk about how the Darkhold found its way to Agatha's coven in the 1600s from a figure named Immortus. These are just ones I'm spitballing, but the MCU is now perfectly set up to just show how every weird thing about the MCU could have been Kang's doing. Every plot hole, from Bruce Banner's suddenly changed appearance of Edward Norton to Mark Ruffalo-esque, to recently the Statue of Liberty going from bronze to green once more between No Way Home and Ms. Marvel, when Ms. Marvel definitely takes place after Spider-Man No Way Home, all of this could be justified as evidence of Kang altering things within his matrix. So this is gonna lead to a Fantastic Four film in November 20. 2024. The main events of which I don't think will be focused on Kang specifically, more likely it's going to be a story about the Fantastic Four and Doctor Doom. But I do think in that movie will be at least one moment where Reed Richards learns that his descendant in the 31st century will be Nathaniel Richards, the cause of pain for so many throughout the multiverse. And I think at this point, as the MCU transitions into Phase 6, we'll get a Young Avengers title, one of those mystery dates on the Phase 6 schedule, because one of those characters is Iron Lad, who is a young Nathaniel, gets displaced from time and tries to avert his future as Kang. So, Avengers the Kang Dynasty is going to be the payoff of this Kang crescendo, as we see the ways Kangs have dominated other timelines by killing Avengers. A bloodbath so widespread that the Kang in Quantumania couldn't even remember if he had killed a Scott Lang before or not. I think the Kang Dynasty has got to be another crossover event the way Infinity War was, one that ends in a major cliffhanger. It's not just going to be whatever the membership of the Avengers is at that point. We're going to get other groups like the Fantastic Four and the mutants joining them in a battle through time to prune or unprune each of the ways the Kangs have manipulated history. Yes, 
yes, this does sound like a time heist part two. And before you say that you've been time traveled out, just imagine a story that is wholly thematically dedicated to that. And rather than one that tries to do something different than Endgame, just doubles down on it. Think about it, a story where Marvel heroes add layer upon layer to the specific events of the time heist we saw in Act 2 of Endgame. Several different Ant-Mans bending over asking to be flicked. Flick me. When the Tesseract suitcase slides to the feet of Loki, and that Loki takes it and zips away off into the Loki series, maybe in this case, that branch timeline gets averted and the suitcase slides to the feet of one of the Kangs. But then it gets snatched away by Reed Richards, who then slingshots it over to Nightcrawler, who grabs it and teleports to Westchester, where now he finds sitting in the wheelchair is, oh, whoops, another Kang. So they gotta reset and do it again. Whatever the main timeline mechanics of the Kang Dynasty look like, I think the route to defeating all of these Kangs will be the way any dynasty ends, from the inside. The Avengers, the Fantastic Four, and the X-Men will have to turn the Kangs against each other, make deals with some to take out the others, maybe make sacrifices to prune a hero's own origin to defeat a particular Kang. They could simplify it, and the Kang Dynasty film will just present six or seven particularly nasty Kangs that the team has to work to undo and defeat one by one. That could give that movie a kind of nice epic structure, the way that Infinity War was just a series of battles over each stone, and kind of a treasure hunt that way. But you could also compare this to something like Kill Bill or Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. At the end of it all will be one final Kang, because there's always one final Kang, Kang Prime. That is the Kang that in the comics sits at the end of all time, really benefiting from all the other Kangs that are warring against each other. And that Kang, I think in the MCU, is going to be the Lord of Battle World, as Phase 6 comes to its conclusion in Avengers Secret Wars. Now, the 2015 Secret Wars storyline has Doctor Doom as the villain who gathers all the Marvel heroes and villains together on a multiversal landscape to fight each other. And while I think Doom is definitely on his way into the MCU soon, I think they're going to want to save him as a villain for Phase 7. Phase 7, oh god, how are we already here? But yes, in Secret Wars, I think Kang Prime is going to use Battle World to trap these Marvel heroes in one sandbox and play them against each other the way they played the Kangs against each other. Kevin Feige was asked about Secret Wars by Josh Horowitz from MTV News. Endgame was so huge. Secret Wars has been talked about. Can you go bigger? Is that important to well, kind of be on that scale? It's not. It's never about going bigger just to go bigger. Sometimes by the nature of the number of characters that you have in the toy box to then bring into the sandbox of the story, things can get bigger. Ah. There it is, Toy Box versus Sandbox. The way to raise the stakes is not another universe-breaking threat, it's really the mix of assets that he has access to. Secret Wars is the event where Kevin Feige likely hopes to get all of the toys back in the Sandbox. That's what makes Secret Wars special. In the comics, it's 616 versus 1610. And boy golly, do I hope we get Miles Morales in this event. I think they'd have a pretty good argument to get Robert Downey Jr. to come back and Chris Evans to come back, Scarlett Johansson. But if the MCU Secret Wars is 616 versus 838, a universe where Patrick Stewart was Charles Xavier. By that logic, might also mean that Hugh Jackman is Wolverine in that universe. James Marsden is Cyclops in that universe. We're not exactly sure. I just think the fact that Kevin Feige wants to do Secret Wars as the next big event that they're working towards is going to be a culmination of his own career. And the first Marvel film that Kevin Feige worked on was the 2000 X-Men. I think the Secret War that gets fought in the MCU is going to be between the Avengers we grew up with and the X-Men we grew up with. That'll break the sandbox. Now, I obviously don't work at Marvel yet. The Kang plans there like considering are as countless as Kang variants themselves. I just think this one is the one that makes the most sense to me. But comment down below with what you think of it. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at EAVOSS. Follow New Rockstars. Subscribe to New Rockstars for more analysis of everything you love. Thanks for watching. Bye.